This presentation will focus on Acts, the book of Acts, chapters 10 through 15, where we now see the apostles in charge of the church as Christ ascends into heaven. So let's first take a look at Acts 10, verses 1 through 8, and then verses 44 through 48, where angel ministers to Cornelius and the Holy Ghost comes to the Gentiles. All of God's children can receive the ministering of angels and a portion of the Holy Ghost to obtain a witness of truth. However, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost is a different matter. Joseph Smith taught, There is a difference between the Holy Ghost and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Cornelius received the Holy Ghost before he was baptized, which was the convincing power of God unto him of the truth of the gospel. But he could not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost until after he was baptized. Had he not taken this sign or ordinance upon him, the Holy Ghost, which convinced him of the truth of God, would have left him. And so... Member, non-members, anyone can receive promptings and revelations by the Holy Ghost to guide and direct them into truth. But only those who are baptized and then confirmed receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which means they have the right to his constant companionship as long as they are worthy. How, how else would non-members know the church is true unless the Holy Ghost testified to them? But if they did nothing about it, then the Holy Ghost would leave. It would not function anymore. Acts 10, verses 44 through 48, records that the Holy Ghost fell upon Cornelius and others before they were baptized. The Bible Dictionary explains that the Holy Ghost is manifested to man on the earth both as the power of the Holy Ghost and, the gift, and as the gift of the Holy Ghost. The power can come upon one before baptism and is the convincing witness that the gospel is true. By the power of the Holy Ghost, a person receives a testimony of Jesus Christ and of his work and the work of his servants upon the earth. The gift can only come after a proper and authorized baptism is confirmed by the laying on of hands. As in Acts 8, 12-25 and Moroni 2. The gift of the Holy Ghost is the right to have, whenever one is worthy, the companionship of the Holy Ghost. Let's now go to Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 33. Peter chosen to introduce the gospel to the Gentiles. As Cornelius' messengers were traveling to Joppa, Peter had a vision in which he was commanded to kill and eat the meat of animals that were forbidden to be eaten under the law of Moses. These animals symbolically represented Gentiles. Peter refused, and the Lord responded, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Though Peter did not at first understand the meaning of the vision, he soon came to understand that the time had come for Gentiles to be baptized into the church without first converting to Judaism. That was common in Jesus' day. They'd first convert to Judaism, then they could convert to Christianity. This revelation regarding Gentile conversion converts came to Peter because he was the chief apostle of the day and he held priesthood keys for the entire church. Revelation for the entire church is always given through proper channels. Elder L. Tom Perry of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of the order by which revelation is received for the church. 
There is order in the way the Lord reveals his will to mankind. We all have the right to petition the Lord and receive inspiration through his spirit within the realm of our own stewardship. Parents can receive revelation for their own families, a bishop for his assigned congregation, and on up to the first presidency for the entire church. However, we cannot receive revelation for someone else's stewardship. The prophet Joseph Smith declared, It is contrary to the economy of God for any member of the church or anyone to receive instruction for those in higher authority than those in authority higher than themselves. You can only receive revelation for what you are stewardship over. So if someone comes and claims this is what the stake or the word should be doing, and it's not the stake president or bishop, then you know that what they received was not from the Holy Ghost. Revelation of the mind and will of God to the church are to come through the first presidency. This is the order of heaven. Let's go to Acts 10, verses 30 through 33. Cornelius's prayer answered through Peter. The Lord frequently answers prayers through the administration of other people, and such was the case with Cornelius. Cornelius desired to know God's will, and he had fasted and prayed for four days. The angel promised Cornelius that Peter would provide him with more information. President Thomas S. Monson described the joy of knowing that the Lord has answered someone else's prayer through us. Quoting, In the performance of our responsibilities, I have learned that when we heed a silent prompting and act upon it without delay, our Heavenly Father will guide our footsteps and bless our lives and the lives of others. I know of no other experience more sweet or feeling more precious than to heed a prompting only discover that the Lord has answered another person's prayer through you. Acts 10, verses 34 through 43, where it's talked about like God is no respecter of persons. The scriptures teach that God is no respecter of persons. That's Acts 10, 34 meaning that every person from Adam to the last person on earth will receive an opportunity to accept the gospel. The principle of salvation are the same for all of God's children. Nephi declared, He inviteth them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness, and he denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, are all alike unto God. Before the events described in Acts 10, the gospel was taught predominantly to the Jews. The new revelation and understanding given through Peter opened the doors for the gospel to be taught to all people without consideration of lineage. A similar pattern followed in 1978 when a revelation received by the First Presidency extended priesthood and temple blessings to all worthy male members of the church without regard for race or color. This revelation, like the revelation received by Peter, teaches that the gospel has always gone forth according to the Lord's timetable. Shortly after the 1978 revelation was announced to the world, Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught the following. Not only is the gospel to go on a priority basis and harmonious to a divine timetable to one nation after another, but the whole history of God dealing with men on earth indicates that such has been the case in the past. It has been restricted and limited where many people are concerned. For instance, in the day between Moses and Christ, the gospel went to the house of Israel almost exclusively. By the time of Jesus, the legal administrators and prophets, prophetic associates that he had were so fully indoctrinated with the 
concept of having the gospel go only to the house of Israel that they were totally unable to envision the true significance of this proclamation that after the resurrection, they should then go to all the world. They did not go to the Gentile nations initially. In his own ministration, Jesus preached only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and has so commanded the apostle. There is order in God's kingdom of when the gospel is taught to whom. And it's under the Lord's timetable. And the past history has shown that God preaches or gives the priesthood or whatever it is to different groups at different times. Bufra McConkey continues, It is true that he made a few minor exceptions because of the faith and devotion of some Gentile people. They, there was one woman who wanted to eat the crumbs that fell from the table of the children, causing him to say, Oh, woman, great is thy faith. That's in Matthew 15, 28. With some minor exceptions, the gospel in that day went exclusively to Israel. The Lord had to give Peter the vision and revelation of the sheet coming down from heaven with the unclean meat on it, following which Cornelius sent the messenger to Peter to learn what he, Cornelius, and his Gentile associates should do. The Lord commanded them that the gospel should go to the Gentiles, and so it was. There was about a quarter of a century then in New Testament times when there were extreme difficulties among the saints. They were weighing and evaluating, struggling with the problems of whether the gospel was to go only to the house of Israel or whether it now went to all men, could all come to him on equal basis with the seed of Abraham. You know this principle. God hath made of one blood of all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him. Acts 17, 26-27 meaning that there is an appointed time for successive nations and peoples and races and cultures to be offered the saving truths of the gospel. Again, let me repeat that. There is an appointed time for successive nations and peoples and races and cultures to be offered the saving truths of the gospel. God will go to different nations, races, and people as he feels on his timetable that they are ready. Back to Elder McConkie. We get our truth and our light, line upon line, precept upon precept. We have now had added a new flood of intelligence and light on this particular subject, and it erases all the darkness and all the views of all the thoughts of the past. They don't matter anymore. On this occasion, the revelation extended the priesthood to all worthy males because of the importuning and the faith and because the hour and the time had arrived, the Lord in his providence poured out the Holy Ghost upon the first presidency and the twelve in a miraculous, a marvelous manner beyond anything that any then present had ever experienced. Acts 10.35, God does favor the righteous. All are indeed like unto God, yet yeah, all, all are indeed unto God, yes. But Acts 10.35 makes it clear that God does, does favor the righteous. A Jaredite king who did not reign in righteousness, wherefore he was not favored of the Lord, Ether 10.13. Joseph Smith gave the following illustration of this principle. Who would not love an affectionate and obedient son more than one who is disobedient and sought to injure him and overthrow the order of his house? 
But God seeth not as man seeth, and he is no respecter of persons. True, but what saith the next verse? He that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. But it does not say that he that worketh wickedness is accepted. And this is a proof that God has respect to the actions of persons. And if he did not, why should he commend? Let me try. And if not, why should he commend obedience to his law? For if he had no respect to the actions of men, he would be just as well pleased with the wicked man for breaking his law as a righteous man for keeping it. And if Cain had done well, he would have been accepted as well as Abel, and Esau as well as Jacob, which proves that God does not respect persons only in relation to their acts. So it's up to us whether we are favored by God, by our obedience or by our disobedience. Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18, the baptism of Cornelius. When Cornelius was baptized, it was the first time in the early history, in the early church, that an uncircumcised Gentile was baptized into the church. This evidence added a new dimension to the preaching of the gospel, allowing Gentile converts to join the church without prior conversion to Judaism was difficult for many of the members of the church to accept. We see that today when the brethren change policy or procedures or something new in the church and many have a hard time accepting it because of past traditions or things that we have done. It signified a major shift in how the gospel was to be shared with God's children. When the Lord had made his covenant with Abraham, which was signified by the rite of circumcision, the Lord had called it an everlasting covenant, Genesis 17:7. 7. What the early Christians came to understand was the difference between the covenant of Abraham and the rite of circumcision. Although the covenant was everlasting, the ordinance by which one entered the covenant was no longer circumcision but baptism. After Peter rehearsed to the saints in Jerusalem, all that occurred in Caesarea, the members of the church had a change of heart and declared, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Let's go to Acts 12, verses 1 through 2. Who was the James killed by Herod? James was the brother of John the Beloved and was a member of the original Twelve Apostles. James served in the First Presidency along with Peter and John until he suffered martyrdom at the hands of Herod Agrippa I in about A.D. 44. He should not be confused with two other men named James in the New Testament. First, James, the son of Alphaeus and Mary, sometimes known as James the, Ju the Less, who was also a member of the original Quorum of the Twelve, or two, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who, like his other brothers, did not accept the divine, the divinity of Jesus while the Savior lived. See that in John 7, verses 1 through 7. Christ, brothers and sisters, that brothers and sisters we had, did not first accept him. It won't be until later that they accept his divine sonship of God. Acts 12, verses 1 through 19. James was murdered, but Peter was delivered. James was killed by Herod's order, but Peter was rescued from prison by an angel sent from God. Some might wonder why the Lord did not save them both. While we do not always know answer to such questions, such as Isaiah 55, 8-9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thought than yours. 
we do know that if we are faithful, the Lord's purposes will be accomplished in our lives. We also know that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, no blessing will be withheld from us in eternity. Oh, sorry, I pushed the wrong button. There is some verses in Alma, chapter 14, 9 through 11, that tells us why God sometimes lets the, the wicked be persecuted or even killed, that there is purpose behind it. In Alma 9, 14, 9 through 11, it says, And it came to pass that they took Alma and Amulek and carried them forth into the place of martyrdom, that they might witness the destruction of those who were consumed by fire. This was the people taking the righteous and killing them, and making Alma and Amulek watch it. Verse 10, And when Amulek saw the pains of the women and children who were consumed, who were consuming in the fire, he also was pained. And he said unto Alma, How can we witness this awful scene? Therefore, let us stretch forth our hands and exercise the power of God which is in us, and save them from the flames. Verse 11, But Alma said unto him, The Spirit constraineth me, that I must not stretch forth my hand. For behold, the Lord receiveth them up unto himself in glory, and he doth suffer that they may do this thing, or that the people may do this thing unto them, according to the hardness of their hearts, that the judgments which he shall exercise upon them in his wrath may be just, and the blood of the innocent shall stand as a witness against them, yea, and cry mightily against them at the last days. So the reason why some of the saints suffer persecution and even death is so that there will, Christ can judge in righteousness and that these deaths will be a witness against the wicked and it will, and it will damn them and show that they had done wicked things to the righteous. Alma 13, verses 2 through 3, leaders receive revelation about callings. The church leaders who called Saul and Barnabas to go on a mission had fasted and received revelation before making important callings. Elder Ronald A. Rasband of the Presidency of the Seventy told about a time when he assisted President Henry B. Irene in assigning full-time missionaries to their fields of labor. After sharing what took place that day, Elder Rasban stated, At the end of the meeting, Elder Irene bore his witness to me of the love of the Savior, which he has for each missionary assigned to go into the world and preach the restored gospel. He said that it is by the great love of the Savior that his servants know where these wonderful young men and women, senior missionaries and senior couple missionaries, are to serve. I had a further witness that morning that every missionary called in this church and assigned or reassigned to a particular mission is called by revelation from the Lord God Almighty through one of those of his servants. Acts chapter 13 verses 3 through 4, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. President Spencer W. Kimball explained that being set apart is of great importance today, just as it was in the ancient church. The setting apart is an established practice in the church, and men and women are set apart to special responsibilities in ecclesiastical, quorum, and auxiliary positions. To some folk, the setting apart seems a perfunctory act, while 
others anticipate it eagerly, absorb every word of it, and let their lives be lifted thereby. The setting apart may be taken literally. It is a setting apart from sin, apart from the carnal, apart from everything which is crude, low, vicious, cheap, or vulgar, set apart from the world to a higher plane of thought and activity. The blessing is conditional upon the faithful performance. In my experience, there have been numerous people who, like Saul, have, through the setting apart, received largeness of heart, extended influence, increased wisdom, enlarged vision, and new powers. Acts chapter 13, verses 6 through 11 talks about false prophets. Joseph Smith taught, false prophets always arise to oppose the true prophets, and they will prophesy so very near the truth that they will deceive almost the very chosen ones. We need to be careful and have, that's why we need the Spirit of the Holy Ghost with us all the time, so that we can detect the false from the true. Acts 13, 8 through 11 and 51 talks about priest and power to curse. But Elamus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Verse 9, then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. And said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead them by the hand. This is similar to Alma's cursing of Korahor in Alma 30, verses 47 through 56. Elder Blue Star McConkie clarified that the priesthood should never be used to curse someone unless the priesthood holder is directed by the Spirit to do so. Cursings as well as blessings may be administered by the power and authority of the priesthood. But the Lord's earthly agents are sent forth primarily to bless and not to curse. And no curse should ever be decreed except by direct revelation from the Lord commanding such to be done. Elder James E. Talmage added this to this principle of the power peace to be using to be cursed said, provided this insight about the Savior's instructions regarding shaking off the dust of one's feet. To ceremonially shake the dust from one's feet as a testimony against another was understood by the Jews to symbolize a cessation of fellowship and a reunification of all responsibilities, a renunciation of all responsibilities for consequences that might follow. It became an ordinance of that accusation and testimony by the Lord's instructions to his apostles as cited in Matthew 10, 14. In the current dispensation, the Lord has similarly directed his authorized servants to so testify against those who willfully and maliciously oppose the truth when authoritatively presented. Because of its serious nature, however, this should never be done except under the direction of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve. It is not meant the ordinance of shaking the dust off your feet to curse someone is not meant for every priesthood holder. That is under the direction of the First Presidency and the Twelve. Acts 13, verse 34, The sure mercies of David, 
The sure mercies of David, Acts 13.34, refer to the promises God made to David of the resurrection. So that's what the sure mercies of David means. It means in God's mercy all will be resurrected. In Acts 13, 38-39, you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Justified means that you are just, without blame, you're innocent, you're not guilty of anything. No one could then be justified by the law of Moses because you would have to have kept it 100%, 100% of the time. And no one has done that because we're all under sin because of our fallen nature. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, whether the violation be great or small, the solution is the same. Full repentance through faith in Jesus Christ and his atonement with obedience to his commandments. I testify that all of the necessary steps to repentance, the most critically important is for you to have a conviction that forgiveness comes in and through Jesus Christ. It is essential to know that only on his terms can you be forgiven. You will be helped as you exercise faith in Christ. That means you can trust him and his teachings. So it is only through the mercy and the grace of Christ are we saved. N not, the law of Moses was only meant to point to Christ who does the saving. The law of Moses could not save anyone because no one could have kept it perfectly. And it was also directed mostly under the Aaronic priesthood. Paul also declared that the Savior made possible justification for all that believe, and that justification could not happen by the law of Moses. Justification is a gift from the Savior. He declares that a person is guiltless, free from the full demands of justice, being put back into a right relationship with God so that progress towards perfection can come. By the time of Christ, the law of Moses had turned into God himself. It had turned into, this is what will save you. Living the law is what brings salvation. They had apostatized that far and misunderstood that it was to point them to Christ. And it's Christ that saves us, that justifies us, that sanctifies us. Acts chapter 13, verses 45-46, we turn to the Gentiles. Many Jews in Antioch reacted to Paul's sermon by contradicting and blaspheming being filled with envy. The Bible Dictionary defines blasphemy as contemptuous speech concerning God or concerning something that stands in, in sacred relation toward God such as his temple, his law, or his prophets. In response to the Antioch Jews' opposition, Paul and Barnabas proclaimed that they would turn to the Gentiles. This moment foreshadowed what would increasingly happen in the missionary work of the church as many Jews opposed the gospel and Gentile conversions. After this event, as Paul traveled to other areas, he typically continued to teach the gospel to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But when Jews rejected his message, Paul readily turned to the Gentiles, finding many ready to receive the gospel. The Jewish people had gotten into their hearts so long that the law of Moses is what saved you, that as Paul and others come along and now preach salvation through Christ, and that the law of Moses has been fulfilled and no longer needs to be followed, is something very difficult for the Jews to accept. 
and many of them could not. It was a stumbling block to them. Acts 14, verses 1 through 6 and 14. Paul and Barnabas were apostles. This is the first reference in the New Testament to Paul being an apostle. According to the Bible dictionary, apostle was a title Jesus gave to the twelve whom he chose and ordained to be his closest disciples during his ministry on earth and whom he sent forth to represent him after his ascension into heaven. The title was also applied to others who, though not of the number of the original twelve, yet were called to serve as special witnesses of the Lord. Paul repeatedly spoke of himself as an apostle. He applied that title to James, the Lord's brother, and also to Barnabas. President Joseph Fielding Smith stated, Paul was an ordained apostle, and without question, he took the place of one of the other brother, brethren in the Council of the Twelve. A vacancy in the Council of the Twelve was probably created because one of the other apostles had been put to death. Acts 14, 8 through 10, the faith to be healed. When Paul and Barnabas learned of a plot against their lives in Iconium, they departed to Lystra and Der Derbe. In Lystra, they met a man who had been crippled from birth. Perceiving that the man had faith to be healed, Paul commanded the man to walk, which he did. This episode illustrates that faith is a prerequ prerequisite for all who would be healed through the priesthood administration. In a notable talk on administering to the sick, President Spencer W. Kimball said, The need of faith is often underestimated. The ill one and the family often seem to depend wholly on the, priest, on the power of the priesthood and the gift of healing that they hope the administering brethren may have, whereas the greater responsibility is with him who is blessed. The major element is the faith of the individual when that person is conscious and accountable. Thy faith hath made thee whole, Matthew 9.22, was repeated so often by the Master that it has almost become a chorus. Acts 14, uh, verses 19 to 22, persecution of the Lord's saints. Some Jews from Antioch and Iconium were vehemently opposed Paul and Barnabas that they followed them to Lystra and persuaded people there to help stone Paul. Paul survived the ordeal and it did not dissuade him, dissuade him from the continuing his labors in spreading the gospel. Elder Robert D. Hells, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained that one reason the Lord does not always shield his servants from persecution is that trials allow us to experience refining, strengthening blessings. Continuing Elder Hells, there is meaning and purpose in our earthly challenges. Consider the prophet Joseph Smith. Throughout his life, he faced daunting opposition, illness, accident, poverty, misunderstanding, false accusation, and even persecution. One might be tempted to ask, why didn't the Lord protect his prophet from such obstacles, provide him with unlimited resources, and stop up the mouths of his accusers? The answer is, each of us must go through certain experiences to become more like our Savior. In the school of mortality, the tutor is often pain and tribulation, but the lessons are meant to refine and bless and strengthen us, not to destroy us. If God saved us from every affliction and affirmity 
and trial that came upon us, we would just become spoiled children and we will not have learned how to become like Christ. Brothers and sisters, in order to become like Christ, we must also go through things like Christ. Acts 14, verses 19, 22, persecution of the Lord's servants continued. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 14 says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and tongues and peoples, stood by the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. This is John the Beloved writing this. Verse 10, And he cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answering, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence come they? And I said to them, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Doctrine and Covenants, section 58, 2 through 4 says, for verily I say unto you, Blessed is he that keepeth my commandments, whether in life or in death, and he that is faithful in tribulation, the reward of the same is greater in the kingdom of heaven. You cannot behold with your natural eyes for the present time the design of your God concerning those things which shall come hereafter, and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. The scriptures are clear that you will have tribulation down here. The key is how do we react to it? Do we have sufficient faith in Jesus Christ to go through tribulation without becoming bitter and without, be offend, without being offended by God? For our Continuing Sex 58, For after much tribulation come the blessings. Wherefore the day cometh that ye shall be crowned with much glory. The hour is not yet, but it is nigh at hand. Acts 15, verses 6 to 31, the questions addressed at the Jerusalem conference. The council at Jerusalem addressed two main questions. First, were Gentile converts required to be circumcised? Second, what if any obligation did Gentile converts have towards the law of Moses? Remember, converted Jews are struggling with this idea of the law of Moses not needing to be kept anymore because of how long they have done it and that how they had turned much of it into just tradition instead of using it to point them to Christ. The question of circumcision was evidently settled early in the proceedings when Peter, the senior apostle, rose up and spoke of his earlier revelation that Gentiles be accepted into the church. That's in Acts 10, 9-16, in chapter 11, verse 18. He also related how uncircumcised Gentile converts had received the Holy Ghost, proving that God had put no difference between us and them. Peter affirmed that circumcision was not a requirement for salvation. For both Jew and Gentile, salvation came through Jesus Christ. The silence that followed Peter's remarks implies that those in attendance understood and accepted the guiding authority of Peter's revelation. 
James addressed the second issue of whether Gentile converts should conform to other requirements of the Law of Moses. James first cited scriptural support for Peter's words, referring to the apostasy in the book of Amos, chapter 9, verses 11 through 12, that Gentiles would seek after the Lord. The scripture would have been persuasive to members of the council who were Pharisees, encouraging them to support Peter in accepting Gentile converts. Next, James proposes that Gentile converts be instructed to observe some requirements of the law of Moses. Remember, we learn line up and line, precept on precept. This is a major change in the church, and so God is doing this little by little. James recommended that Gentile converts be taught to abstain from pollution of idols, meaning meats that have been polluted by being offered to idols and from fornication. In short, converts were to avoid becoming entangled with the sexual sin and idolatry that were rampant in the ancient Greco-Roman world. Because the law of Moses prohibited the eating of blood, James counseled to abstain from things strangled and from blood may have been meant to avoid giving offense to Jews and thus hindering missionary work among them. James explained, For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him. In other words, since there were Jewish communities throughout the Mediterranean world, Gentile converts should avoid offending Jews and dissuading them from embracing the gospel. So that is why this doing away with the law of Moses, that they did this in steps and line upon line and precept upon precept so that they could help Jews come into the church and accept the Savior Jesus Christ. And so they required a few things of the Gentiles so that it would help the Jews become interested in the gospel and hopefully re receive salvation through the Savior. James 15, 13 to 29, James. James played an important role at the Jerusalem Conference. He was the son of Joseph and Mary and the half-brother of Jesus Christ. At this time, he was the leader of the branch of the church in Jerusalem. Because of Jerusalem's importance, James's position in the church was highly regarded. Paul called him an apostle. He is the same James mentioned in Acts 12, 17, 21, verse 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 7. He is also probably author of the epistle of James. Acts 15, 22 through 28, the Holy Ghost guided leaders. In order to come to a unified decision that was in harmony with God's will, members of the Jewish council sought the guidance of the Holy Ghost, speaking of the proceedings of this conference, Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated, having arrived at what they considered to be an appropriate solution, that is, adopting James' statements which were based on Peter's announcement of principle, the council then asked the Lord if their conclusions were true and in, according, in accord with his mind. The answer, coming from the power of the Spirit, certified to the ver verity of their conclusion. Elder D. Todd Christopherson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of the Holy Ghost's role in the Jerusalem Conference. After Paul, Barnabas, and perhaps others spoke in support of Peter's decision, James moved that the decision be implemented by letter to the church, and the council was united with one accord. In the letter announcing their decision, the apostles said it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us, 
or in other words, this decision became divine revelation through the Holy Spirit. These same patterns are followed today in the restored church of Jesus Christ. The president of the church may announce or interpret doctrines based on revelation to him. Doctrinal exposition may also come through the combined council of the first presidency and the quorum of the twelve apostles. Council deliberations will often include a weighing of canonized scripture, the teachings of church leaders, and past practices. But in the end, just as in New Testament church, the objective is not simply consensus among council members, but revelation from God. It is a process involving both reason and faith for obtaining the mind and the will of the Lord. And so that's why they said the Gentiles did not have to be circumcised or go through that ordinance. That had been done away with. But there were a few things that the Gentiles were still required to do under the law of Moses as this transition of the church, which is a huge transition with them, was slowly taking effect. And so God was helping them little by little to see that the law of Moses meant to point them to Christ so that Christ could save them, not the law. We have this in the church today when the brother changed different procedures or practices or add something we should do. And some people become confused, some become offended, some leave the church not understanding that God will guide and direct his church and change things according to his time pattern. And then it will be tested to see if we have faith that they are guided and directed by the Savior. Acts 15, 22 through 28, the Holy Ghost leader continues, even though there were difference of opinions and much dis disputing among church leaders, they ultimately achieved unity as they responded to the promptings of the Holy Ghost. President James E. Faust taught about the importance of harmony in church councils. In some legislative assemblies of the world, there are some groups termed the loyal opposition. I find no such principle in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Savior gave us his solemn warning, Be one, and if you are not one, you are not mine. Doctrine and Covenants 38.27 The Lord made it clear that in the presiding quorums, every decision must be by the unanimous voice of the same. That is, every member in each quorum must be agreed to its decision. This means that after frank and open discussion, decisions are reached in council under the direction of the presiding officer who has the ultimate authority to decide. That decision is then sustained because our unity comes from full agreement with righteous principles and general response to the operation of the Spirit of God. Despite church leaders' unanimous resolution to not require Gentiles to be circumcised prior to baptism, many church members did not readily understand or accept the decision. This is what I've been talking about. They're having a hard time that the law of Moses is fulfilled. Robert J. Matthews taught, the action of the Jerusalem Council involved a significant policy decision. Peter's unmistakable experience with Cornelius makes it clear that the brethren understood that the law of Moses was fulfilled in Christ. But evidently, many members of the church did not understand it was a matter of doctrine, tradition, culture, and emotion. Even though the brethren had settled the matter doctrinally a decade before, Considerable time passed before the matter was settled culturally and emotionally in the minds of the Jewish Christians. Furthermore, at least 10 years after the council, many Jewish Christians in Jerusalem were still following the law 
of Moses. The decision of the Jerusalem Council was not definitive and did not forthrightly say that the law of Moses should be discontinued, although it declared that Gentiles did not need circumcision for salvation, and it did not say that Jewish members of the church need not circumcise their sons. So again, we see the Lord working with them, line up them in line, piece of pump precept, here a little, there a little, as he's trying to make this major shift from the law of Moses to the doctrine of Christ. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.